talk about a man that knows how to get things done. I sat down with Will Foden, who has been on the podcast before, and I wanted him back to do part two because he has changed so much over the last few years. He's done so much in terms of transitioning back from Singapore to the UK, but also putting his business online and also changing who he's serving in that business. Not only is he serving high powered CEOs, but now he's also coaching coaches, so fitness PTs at an elite level. And that brings with it both a lot of responsibility, but also a lot of growth and then also huge results. And so he's someone that I know will touch many of your hearts. His story will as well. He offers a lot of advice of how you can implement this. It doesn't matter if you're not a PT or a fitness instructor, you can take some of this advice and you can implement it today to get better results, but also to sharpen your mind and to become just an all round better human. Will is uh, just an amazing superstar, really powerful chat. It really hit me with some of the things that he shared and I'm sure it will hit you too especially around how he has been doing some of the endurance events, what his mindset was like going into that, some of the things that he's been coming up against and also working through, but also how he's helping people in a new realm. And I think a lot of us can relate to that when we're starting out in a new way and we're forging a path. I love that Will says he will not be out hustled. You won't out hustle Will Foden. And that is so cool. If you've got that level of confidence that you know you're going to be putting in the work day after day, to execute, to be going out there that you can say, I will not get out hustled. Just think about that mindset and soak it in and try to take some of this for your own mindset and how you implement in your own day and go about it. If you're facing a challenge right now, take some of this today in this conversation and push forward. Take some of this and just get determined. This is your time to shine. And Will Foden lets it rip in this episode. But yeah, man. Yeah, so Absolutely. good to have you on. I'm like really excited about this and what we're going to do today. Really Likewise, man. I'm happy. It's, it's good to always, always good catching up with you and talking shop. But yeah, being on your podcast. Thank you very much, mate. That'd be so, so awesome. Well, Will Foden, good to have you back. It's been a couple of years since we did this. It was actually August 2020, man. Can you believe since we last <laughs> sat down? A lot, a lot of water under the bridge since then, my man. Ah, oh, there's been so much. And I, I guess to intro this properly for you, like you are the coach of coaches, an elite level coach, and just seeing what you've done over the last two years, that's why I wanted to bring you back on because it's been incredible. Not only watching Thank your you. journey, but like like your transition. Like you last time we spoke, we were in Singapore and you were in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. And you were an elite level PT and you were running a business. And so a lot has changed, and you've obviously moved back to the UK which isn't a transition in itself, but then seeing how you've taken your game to the next level and the next level, and just looking at things like your Instagram, but the, the quality of the content and the value that people are getting and the way that you're transforming lives, it's just, it's blown me away. So I wanted to get you back on, not only because of that, but Thank also because much, of some of the achievements. Like it's like, you just keep smashing goals. And that's what we're all about on this podcast. So I'm just, I've been blown away. And I, I think there's just so much value that we can unpack in this conversation just through that story of what's been going on for you for the last two years. For sure. No, firstly, thank you very much, man. I don't know. It's always very strange when uh, you get to the, those sort of comments because you never think, actually, yeah, I have done that quite a lot since, we, since we've been. You never really think that, do you? You're always in the moment and you're always busy trying to push for the next thing, whether sitting back and seeing how far you've come. Um, and then since, I mean, the guys on the podcast, well, no, like, the way me and you met was always very much part of what your book was about was just taking action. I literally emailing you saying, mate, I need to meet you because, because of our story. And the people will talk about sort of the way that things aligning and that kind of thing. It was just purely a case of, like I said, connection. And I think it is very much a case of what's happened since Singapore. I think COVID massively shook, shook the roost a bit and related because I wasn't going anywhere. Me and my wife weren't now wife. She wasn't then. Um, and it's just more of a case of just taking charge. I think I, I read it. I read a quote yesterday on um, it was from, from an email actually from uh, Ryan Holiday, and it was like, "Don't you don't need to always take control, but you just need to take charge." And I think that's what I I massively try and embody is I don't know how I'm going to win, 
but I just know I'm not going to lose. That's what Vikings, if anyone wants to know that. But it's very much that of, there's so many, it's very true. Like, I think too many people are stuck in this in this rut of trying to find the perfect time, the perfect situation, the perfect, insert any, your own bullshit, excuse my French, rather than, like we've mentioned, around having things that you can control. Can you control the controllables? Can you, Are you actually leading yourself? Are you actually embodying your message have you got a mission all these things that fulfill a human i think i've massively found my my sort of rolling card or, or sort of my flow state or however you want to describe it i found that, that i've realized what i am what i stand for what i don't stand for and then obviously building a company around that now at the moment that that's what's the most exciting thing because i've realized that the, the authentic version of you is one that's on your mission not someone else's mission which the problem with stuff like social media and there's so much noise and there's so much like oh i see this person doing this or i see this person doing that rather than getting up in the morning and looking yourself in the mirror and knowing that you're on your own shit is the most important thing to anybody because i think that gives you confidence like and that gives you clarity and, and certainty those are the three things that i'm i'm very i'm big on at the moment of, of delivering because we can get information anywhere like 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 the, the, anything whatever you whatever you're trying to achieve go on youtube youtube's probably the best dictionary or best search engine out there that's not why you're struggling that's not why you're finding it difficult it's you haven't got that chip on your shoulder to, to prove yourself right you're busy trying to prove other people wrong and that's what i'm i, I think i learned since being a professional rugby player i used to try and prove everybody that i was good enough where now my mission is not to prove anybody else that I'm trying to prove myself that I can do it. Not, I don't care what anyone else is doing. I, I, I keep my, 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 my circle close. I keep my inputs more importantly to people that I aspire to either be like, look, not look like physically because I look like a jigsaw puzzle gone wrong. But from a, an emotional standpoint is similarly, the reason why me and you first connected was because mm -hmm. I read your story and you were five years ahead of me in relation to your growth how you operate mentality, mindset, and hence why people who know me, I'm fluid dyslexic. Like I speak dyslexic, let alone read it. And I, my missus has never seen me read a book so heavily in my life. Not because it's, not that it's not life-changing, but more to the point that it spoke to me and my mission, what I was trying to find and figure out. And I think that's where people get lost. And that's, again, probably what I've, I've done over the last year of coming home is moving yeah like i said in a, 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 i was working in the cbd in singapore working with everyone from professional athletes ceos to i i de dealt with some general population too and realizing the crossovers between performance of being an athlete and being a high a heavyweight businessman or woman there's so many similarities and i, th I think people are very focused on the minutiae detail of the outcome i want a million dollars i want three i want to have a 200 person business, which is making X, you, you, they're not focusing on the day to day, the, the sort of elements of their day that are going to snowball and have consistency throughout that journey. As mentioned to you, is, is, is that what you mentioned before around weekly? We both, like you, I, I know, I don't, we haven't even talked about your sort of endeavors, and I know full well that they're going to be million mile up here somewhere. That would be everywhere. Most people look at you like you're on drugs because you're wanting to push yourself so hard. But the way that you eat an elephant is by one bite at a time. And you're you're going, no, no, today's today's job, today's mission is I've got to do this. Bang, done, next. Then you move into the other things like being a dad and all that kind of thing, which is obviously as and much more important. But I think that's probably where I, I changed as a as a as a coach, but I, I realized that it was just more than that. I think that's what happened. There is more to it. So bringing that all together, because there's a lot in there to unpack, but like, so you changed your perspective on how you're going to go and operate and what it meant to take, you know, what you're speaking about in terms of taking discipline in a mindset, but also taking responsibility and ownership for your situation, not, not kind of expecting the world to change around you, but you changing as well. What is, Million. what is the state strong collective all about then? So in terms of that, business what what does that mean so the stay strong collective is is basically building a community of, of people to learn to, uh, to lead themselves we build clarity confidence and certainty within their high in the high performance realm we're looking at working with strength coaches athletes or ex-athletes and high performers 
to basically it is it's basically taking athleticism and performance from from all aspects of life and using that to build leadership within the realms of team sports businesses as well as coaching businesses especially that like, i mean it's taken a few um twists and turns just because of the industries that i've been in i mean my bread and butter is i'm a strength and conditioning coach I, i've worked in strength and conditioning i've worked in the gym since i was 14 I've been, I've done a degree, a master's degree. I've got uh, lots of different, I spent a lot of money on education around nutrition. So I'm, I'm, I've always been a high performance uh, coach, whatever terminology people wanted to use for it. I've always built around strength, conditioning and nutrition to make people elevate their performance. Performance for me now is not just working with i've worked with guys who are fighting in the one championship for example so they're professional fighters that that is a level of performance but i, I don't see there's no difference between them and a mum of two kids who wants to be a role model reason why i say that is most people who i deal with in that realm they have similar traits around discipline ownership actual integrity in what they're doing they understand the common goal they understand what they're trying to be the Stay Strong Collective is actually educating people with the tools to have confidence in what they're doing and realize, and giving them the tools to, to sort of the systems to be able to do that. Having clarity on their mission, like your, your, your spiritual mission is probably the biggest, I think the biggest conundrum people see is people associate spiritual mission with religion. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm Spiritual mission is why you put on this planet. And I, 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 that's not, a, I, I'm not a, open-handed i'm an atheist i don't, I don't i'm not i'm not religious uh, each to their own mm -hmm. but every day you wake up if you haven't got a, a chip on your shoulder to, to be the next version of you for other people you're not going to build the impact that you desire so that's something that i'm very 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 proud of and then certainty i think certainty is actually systemization of people's every day because every we all talk about compound interest is is is, is thrown around willy-nilly in, in most circles especially ones that used to deal with money. But people don't see that compound interest has everything to do with your health, mental health, physical health. It has everything to do with your sort of your vocational happiness. It happens to do with your, with with, um, with finances, which again, finance shouldn't be what Rolex you're wearing. It's how much wealth do you have? Or, or are you wealth building and actually building a platform for you to protect you and your family? Or are you buying a Porsche? Like, Firstly, don't buy a Porsche because a Porsche is a shit car. But the, like, like that, <laughs> that's what, like, like, if yeah, I've we'll go on that tangent. But my, my, the point is, the Stay Strong Collective is basically helping mainly coaches and high performers achieve that, elevate their standards, give them clarity, confidence, and certainty in what they're doing throughout holistic health. So physical, and mental performance is sort of the, the nuts and bolts of it. But we're, we're, we've taken it from a different angles. It started, I run, I run a one-on-one -on -one coaching business uh, to start with, and then we've started doing consultancy. So at the moment, I'm consulting coaches and working in their business with them. So I'm basically taking them away from the everyday and mapping out start vision planning, spirit, like building a spiritual mission around their company because then suddenly the company's got substance. It's not just, it means something. It's not, I think a lot of people pay lip service to like buzzwords and look into books and don't action stuff and that i think that's the most thing that frustrates me is there's so many people that i'm i'm speaking to similarly like the, the analogy for me is like when i first met you you were you're five years ahead of me you still are five years ahead of me but the reason why i keep climbing the ladder is not because i'm chasing you but i'm using your what you've been through to, to elevate me vice versa what i do is i take take men and women who are either like i said professionals ex-athletes or coaches who are five years behind me and i give them the systems and the the sort of and the understanding about why they're doing it how they're doing it and what they need to do to progress those are the the, the nuts and bolts of it and I'm, that's that's the that's what my spiritual mission is is, is is i love working with an underdog and i know when i work with people that i know have got more in the locker it's not it time stops and i think that's really important that people understand is you have to have something that lights you up. If you're doing a job or a task that you absolutely hate, that's that's the world telling you something. If you're not waking up, like I said, I, people that know you know that you're getting up at four in the morning with kids jumping on your head and you send any photos of you wearing a party hat as a nose when you're doing a business call, you, you, you're a normal dude. Like, however much you are Superman to your kids and your missus, you bleed the same.
what's the difference between you and other people is that you've got a chip on your shoulder to demand more from yourself and your situation. No excuses. Because you're on your mission. And I think that's where people go wrong is they put all these behaviours in, in, in any success realm that are unsustainable because that's not their wheelhouse. That's not what they're there for. And I think that's huge. There's so much I love about what you just said. There's so much in there that I love. I just, I just love everything about what you're doing and the, the way that this journey has gone for you. The fact that now, yeah. even, even when you're speaking, right, I can see through your energy and through how this is lighting up that you're also, you're on your spiritual mission and you're delivering your purpose whilst helping other yeah. people find their purpose. And like you said in, in explaining it, iron sharpens iron, but it's also like you're helping someone because you've been through this process. You've ha now got the wisdom. And so you're able from an expert level to be able to just tweak a few things and bring people in. And those few things that you tweak, they wouldn't be able to see themselves. You need someone who's gone through the process, who has got to a certain level to then be able to come back and go, hang on, look, this is, this is not where we need to be doing it. And, and actually saying and holding people accountable, right? And it's quite a difficult job when people come into it thinking potentially that it's going to be a walk in the park and they can, they can, you're kind of covering up that slippage and you're saying, nah, this is not acceptable because you're raising the bar, right? You're, you're helping them yeah. raise the bar, but you've got to be that accountability person to say, that's not good enough. Unfortunately, if you say where you want to get to is here and you want to be doing it. And so I love so much about what you just said. The fact that stay strong collective has taken off in the way it has and just watching what you've done, like the feats of endurance, but also the people that you're coaching. So the Ironman World Championships in Utah, I saw you go out, go out with um, your man out there and just yeah, yeah. coach, taking people really, really far in terms of their own personal growth. How then, and what are the sort of things that people are tripping up on when it applies to business? Or what is this kind of stumbling block or the most common parts of this if we take that angle? Um. If you uh, mainly from a business standpoint, is they haven't like I said, they haven't got an actual why they're doing it. I and I speak I speak mainly at the I'll, I'll go first to who I mainly work with and I, I deal with more high performers that I've got, I, 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 who are CEOs of law firms and stuff and we've had similar conversations. But the guys who I'm currently consulting who are mainly strength coaches and coaches in general of different high performing realms, they don't under, the reason why they've got into coaching itself was because they're, they're filling a void their personal void of when they were younger an example me i was an obese child i got into year year seven and a girl called freya called me fat in a swimming pool and then i literally went from right this <laughs> lost a shitload of weight got some form of body dysmorphia and then ever since then i was always told i couldn't do something whether i i, I decided to i decided to play to aim to play professional rugby now you're too small, I've got bigger. Now you're too slow, I've got to get faster. Now you're not fit enough, I've got to get faster. Da, 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 da. So I was always built around proving, proving my point. I think what most people do are two things, is they don't realise that your, your the struggles that you've gone through build what you are. And it's acknowledging what those are and how you can leverage them. Like I, I know that I am, not, I am by far not the strongest, fittest person in the room, but I'm willing to die. Like if, if you take me, if, if, if you put me in a fight, I'm willing to, I'll go all in. There's not a, but I've had that mentality throughout everything. I've had that with rugby. I mean, I was, I was, I was a good rugby player, but I, by no means the most skilled, but you, if you wanted to go to war against me, like you're picking the wrong dude. Problem with that was, is I didn't leverage that properly. So I used to get emotional and I used to use rage as, as, as a fuel source. I think rage has got, it's got no direction. Now I'm very much a case of, using my passion in the right area make the build builds an unstoppable force if you're if you're if you're passionate about something but don't understand the vessel it needs to go in that's probably where i think most people get tripped up with they firstly don't live by what their means are they're getting affected by a lot of people are using social media social media is like masturbation it's it's boring once you finish because what most people do is they don't use it in the right way. They, they, they're they not using social media to elevate their, their emotional, physical, psychological standard. What they're using it for is an escape route. Then what happens is they 
they take what they see and they feel they have to copy that person because they're not knowing, they don't know what they stand for. That's what I, when I get a coaching with me, I'm like, what do you stand for? Who are you? And not many people actually can look themselves in the mirror and go, do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you know what I can see? Do you know what, do you know what my dark spaces are? People, I mean, people will, will think that me and you, uh, I've, I've, because we're so confident in a room, that we've got no problems. Every day I sit there sometimes, I go, fucking hell, what's going on here? Excuse my French. And that's that's the, the key is when I'm going through chaos and when I'm feeling like I'm out of control, when I feel like I've got so much work coming out my ears that I don't know what to do with, it's leaning into that pressure because the analogy of a diamond's form under the pressure is very, very true, is you're supposed to feel like that. If you, are, you have the ambition to, 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 to do the things that you say you want, i.e. make X amount of money, have this much impact, be this level of, want to be a world champion. Don't, nothing ever, ever came from not doing the hard work. And that's probably where I find coaches haven't earned it, or coaches and that people who are in my hyper high sort of leadership realm, they haven't earned the right to do what they do, or they haven't acknowledged what's made them do it. So they haven't, they haven't realized that they, they're running away from their suffering and don't ever want to talk about it instead of embracing it and saying thank you for it because that's literally what's built their value system. And that, you blow people's minds as soon as they see, they see that, that like you said, I, I, I openly admit that I, I've been through a lot more than most people my age from an emotional standpoint, from being in an abusive relationship before, not my missus now, pretty previous one, we were both as bad, it was terrible, to losing all my money, to having my legs snapped in half by a horse, like, yeah, I've always been on the upward trajectory in relation to trying to walk uphill, dragging a load of stuff with me. But I can always look back and I can be, I could be very sorry for myself for some of the decisions I've made, or I can realize they have what made me. And that's probably why I've got so much passion is I, I don't feel like I'm special. I just feel like I've got a, a, my, my gift as, as a man is have the ability to, to hype people up and make them realize they've got more in the locker. And that's and that's what is that's the cool thing about my job. But most people, yeah, most people don't understand what they value. They have no clarity of what they're actually trying to achieve. And when they get there, they don't realize that this is a this is a self fulfilling prophecy or it's a continual journey. There's a I've actually just ordered a book from um, Simon Sinek called The Infinite Game. And apparently, it's, it's amazing. But that that's literally what this is: is once I've reached this first echelon, by default, I want more. So you're never going to be happy if you're you're focusing on that end result all the time. Don't get me wrong. I've I, I've I've got guys in my books and ladies in my books who fight. I've got some that fight for Singapore, some that fight internationally as jiu-jitsu athletes. That we peak those athletes on purpose because they're on strength and conditioning. For coaches and and high performers who are on a consultancy basis as well, it's about spreading out that grey area and showing them what's built them. Because an example is if is if someone comes to me asking for weight loss and they're already they're already in great shape, it's quite obvious that they they used to be fat themselves. They used to be back in the day. They used to be a melted wheelie bin. They're now no longer that, but they associate with that because I know that because that was me. That was what I was. I was a fat kid who it wasn't anyone's fault. I'm not in. I didn't used to eat sweets, but I used to eat three roast dinners because I love. That was my that was my jump. But I know what it's like to look yourself in the mirror with an eight pack and still call yourself fat. Like I know that because I've done that myself. So breaking that barrier of I, I accept that I can see it and acknowledge it, but I don't use that as fuel anymore. And I used to use that as fuel. I used to just work harder because I wanted to get even more shredded or whatever. It doesn't work that way. So yeah, that, that that's currently how that sort of works. This is a really important point. And I think just to, just to, so what I'm hearing is you used to use something as your purpose to motivate you. And what we're saying is now is that actually the reason why that runs flat with whatever, whether it's a CEO or someone else, is because it's not the actual true purpose. It's just something that motivated them to at the time to, to play the game yeah. to get better. And so what we're breaking down here is they come to you and you're able to take them on a journey whereby you can identify and help them identify within themselves their true purpose which is actually going to burn white hot for them so that they have the extra gears to actually go as hard as they can 
because if you're going to lift a business off the ground it's going to have to take a lot of that emotional energy there's and that's that's kind of what i think you were calling out whereby you were saying like you either know or you don't know and if you've been through it you know that how dedicated you have to be and just how on point you have to be and how you do not have time to chase the push that you don't inevitably need or want anyway so working these things out becomes critically important to you because else you're just going to run flat because you're not going to be able to invest the time the emotional energy and the critical priority of actually delegating and executing on tasks that you don't even want to do at the time because you know that they're going to get you to the end result so with that all said what i'd love to dig into now is a bit about the anger and the rage piece because so, if that's how would you help like how or what advice would you give to someone who is using anger rage as a motivator to get them to perform at a high level and how has your perception changed of that now um Jordan Peterson has a wicked quote where it says that every man should have a monster, but they should learn how to tame it. And that's, that's, I, I'm very aware that like I, when I was a young kid, my rage was against my, was, was against proving people that I was good enough. And I, I think people, some people aren't angry enough and haven't got a chip on their shoulder to prove other people wrong, but some people take that way too far. And I think there's a time and a place for that. There's a book, um, from James Keir called Legacy, which is around the, he followed the All Blacks. And he basically talks around their, their mantras around obviously from being the, the best sports team ever, how they, 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 they um, how they work in business realms. Mm -hmm. And when I read that book and it talks about having a blue mindset, it talks around that the, 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 the All Blacks, the way, the way that they play is systemized and it's like a machine. One plus one equals two. We do this, we do this, we do this. With rage, rage is using your, your primitive side of your brain, um, which if anyone's read the monkey, the, the chimp paradox, this is a bit where you haven't got control of, it's more subconscious. That hasn't got a, a skill set of putting that energy in the right bucket. So you can use rage in, a, in, a, in an amazing way to drive you forward, or you can use rage which will actually break you down and really destroy what you've just done. And what I do with people who, um, who have got sort of, Forms of anger management, which is, is, is basically what it is. Firstly, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't tell, I don't try and clinically diagnose that or anything. What I, I've done neuro linguistic programming, so NLP, which is around communication, how you frame your environment and how your perception of what you're seeing. What I do is I find out what really, really pisses them off. I use um, a disc assessment, um, which is like a personality test. And you can see the peaks and troughs in which people, how they resonate. You can see the frames they put themselves. You put me in a in a, in a in a, an offensive situation, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. I'll step up. I'll, I'll literally be on the front line, helmet on. Get me in the trench. I'm getting in there. My personality is is, is that I'm very much that. I'm very much if there's a problem, I'll solve it. Other people they shy away from 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 pressure. When I'm coaching someone who's using rage. Firstly, we need to understand whether that, that, that's actually driving them forward or that's they're hindering them. If it's hindering them, we dig deep and why, they, why they've got range. Most people I've found who have some form of sort of um, an emotional state that's counterintuitive, it, it all stems from when they're a kid. They've got some, they've had some hang up from their mum, their dad, their auntie, uncle. There's a situation that's happened that's really, really hammered them. And what they've done is they've never, ever looked that in the face. They've never, they've never seen the dark pieces of why they're doing things. They never understand even stuff like people joke around saying the language that you use frames your environment. And it's very true. I, there's, there's obviously people, people will, will know this. There's a book called The Secret, which says about its law of attraction, right? And law of attraction to most people is wushu rubbish. But it's only wushu rubbish because you don't, you don't see the point of that. The point of that is that the truth around the secret is that you put yourselves in the situations that you want to be in. You frame your environments the way that you want to frame them. You, you um, articulate and, and manifest things in your brain that can be there, but can also not be there. So your biggest problem is you're fighting your shadow. And that's what people, I, I, this is what I, I learned, was if I wasn't such an emotional rugby player, I probably wouldn't have been played professional as, like, the way that I did. But if I'd learned to have controlled that monster way better, 
and without getting, I had a major knee injury. So I, I, I came back from that, played again professionally. If that hadn't have happened, well, I hadn't have left. I used to, I was at Exeter Chiefs for pre-season. I decided not to go for personal reasons because I was in the wrong headspace. Could I have played any higher? I don't know. Maybe because I would have made better instead of if someone started a fight with me on a rugby pitch, I'd literally, I didn't care about the rugby. I wanted my elbow in his face or me on top of him talking about his mum. Like I didn't care. And the point of that is, is now in business, I use my passion as a fuel source and I use my passion to motivate people. And I use my passion to drive me out of bed in the morning because I thought I, I know what money I want to make. I know that I'm, I want to punch through a ceiling and say hello to people that I've scared the shit out of me because why not? I haven't, I have, I don't have a ceiling any. I'm like, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And people joke, again, people hear that quote and they're like, they give it lip service. It's not, I'm, most people, unless you win the lottery, you're not lucky. They'll out hustle you. And that's, that's what I'm, I'm very proud that I I'm I, I won't get out hustled like that's that I don't care who you could be worth a million dollars and I'll I'll hustle you in the endeavor. Don't get it twisted. I'm I, I'm way better at finding balance than some people. I used to train a client who I've never met a man function with that like, that amount of sleep in my life. Who's worth millions? Could I out hustle him from an intellectual standpoint? No, but I'll outlast him. Probably on this planet because he'll probably won't be here very long because he doesn't really look after himself. But <laughs> like that, that's that's where it's it's. I know that I've got. It's teaching someone to know who whatever you want to get there. It's like Jekyll and Hyde. They know they've got Hyde in the background. That if you want it, come at me. I'm choosing not to use it. The most powerful thing you can do is know that because if you can choose not to use it. You then got this calm, blue, functional, systemized mindset that's using the front of your your your, your um your executive brain, which is the, the science term of it, using your executive sense to think, adjust, and move forward, rather than using your primitive brain, which is not there for decision making, it's there to save your life. Or the perception of you looking like if you look into a situation and you're you're seeing volatility, unless someone's coming at you with an axe, and then, then there is volatility there. But if you're in the office and someone's being a dick. The question is, are you are you going to rip their head off or take it personally? Or are you actually going to think, systemize, operate and move forward and learn how to deal with that situation without emotion will get you nowhere in that situation? Because otherwise it's a war. Um, what's that? Adam Grant talks about arguing with people as like it's two two things colliding together. Whereas what we should be talking about is how teaching each other how to dance properly. I dance obviously like a fridge. But if you can push and move when they're moving and pushing, how can you get you can't lose you can move differently you can see things differently you can adjust course and move forward but that's the if it's rage it's, it's me versus you the vikings analogy of one of us is going up, up to up, upstairs and he's seeing Valhalla the other one's going to move forward I, most we haven't got those situations you're talking about that that's what I think it's, it's fighting the, there's a couple of the other book is it's called fighting the wicker man it's like the little thing in your head you're trying to fight is pointless and that's what I teach I teach people to openly see it and we deal with it like i've got clients of mine i i, I openly i i had nlp coaching from a guy called jay headley um he works with ceos in singapore as well he's actually in australia i've done i've done the nlp course with him the biggest thing that i've used with my clients help who are functioning at high at high levels of operations before i was practicing well, before i was helping practice it was send them to him because that's his wheelhouse Mm -hmm. unpack your shit sort it out come back to me and we'll do this suddenly people are like ready mission 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 and i think that's where it is is when you see your dark space and appreciate it and also know that it's still there when you need it just sort it when did that all change for you then to move from living and acting from the dark space to then knowing that it's a tool in your strategy that you can whip out whenever you need it and knowing when it's appropriate i started to um i started to when i moved to singapore playing rugby so my background played professional rugby played semi-pro rugby for 10 years in the uk um went over to manly played in sydney came back was still playing semi-pro here moved to singapore openly from a, from a front-on perspective to make more money 
we, I, I because friends of mine were there making good coin. Emotionally, I'd had enough of rugby, and, and, and this was the world telling me I had to find my way. Um, I started looking into things around value systems, and I there's a friend of mine called Jake Ackler who he was a um, Formula One strength and conditioning coach. Came to came to Singapore, did a talk around mental performance. He used to work with Max Verstappen. Mm-hmm. And you know when you're sat in a room and someone's talking about these problems and you just go, yep, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. Oh, shit, that's me. Yeah, I've done that before. Oh, God. And I literally walked up to him and was like, mate, the coach you've worked with, I need to speak to him. Or you, you tell me. I said, I- I'm, everything you just said is you've literally stripped me naked in front of a thousand people here and I'm, no one knows apart from you. Like, and I've got nothing <laughs> to show off. Like, so he, he gave me Jay's name. Fast forward, I, I, I took, I did 10 sessions with him and it really, it opened my mind around the reasons behind my decisions. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, and then I really, I started reading more. I had a big thing where I used to use dyslexia as a, um, as a shield for saying, saying that reading was boring. Uh, being funny enough, my mum's a librarian at a very posh school and an English teacher. And my dad has written a book. So like, so it's, it makes no sense. Um, and I started seeing, I started seeing patterns in my behavior that I emotionally knew were wrong. Not wrong. I, I emotionally knew were not advantageous to my situation. And I realized that the gut feelings of, do you know what, mate, rugby is, it's, it's not what it used to be to you. I used to, I said, my, reason, my, my dad said when I was a kid, I used to play quite high level tennis. I was on the road to Wimbledon when I was 15. Um, and I came home, I got absolutely battered on the first round by this little Asian kid who was half my size, half my weight, and I walked in thinking I'm going to smash this kid, and he ruined me. And I just said to my dad, I said, Dad, uh, tennis doesn't make me feel alive anymore. When I get on a rugby pitch, time stops. My dad used that with me for everything. He kept asking me, did you, did you feel on fire and did time stop? And when rugby, that happened, I actually broke my rib in Singapore because of it. Um, I realized there was there must have that rugby wasn't be all and end all. And there was the life after my identity was a rugby player. That's probably the the biggest piece of this is who who are you? And I always said I was that guy who I was always a rugby player. Didn't care. I, I might again the, the the previous relationship I was in, we were we've been with each other for a long period of time since I was 17. It outlasted, it outlasted us emotionally, but we both hated each other by the end of it. And we, I, I ended up getting nearly, well, nearly, I could have got killed because of, not because of her, but because of the situation we were in by getting trampled by a horse. That wasn't her fault. That was my fault for not taking, taking the situation and owning it. And I think what, from that point, I realised that there was, there was a different, there was going to be life after rugby. I then realised after the coaching and started reading and like I said, Red Legacy, which is a massive influence on me because I, I, I respected the All Blacks so much and realised that what I'd been doing was using emotion to drive my process and that was either really good or really bad. Mm-hmm. And then I started doing way more. I did a course um, with my PT, with um, the Muscle Nerds of Luke Lehman and Zoe. And they, they, it's basically, it's not functional. It's like functional medicine, but it's, it's, it's PT level. It teaches you around stress physiology. It teaches around what your emotional state will do to your central nervous system. It teaches you around biochemistry in relation to food. And I linked all my professionalism around my strength, conditioning and nutrition. I took that, my whole business and my whole mindset around high performance just went whoop and realized that sport was sport is brilliant. And I love sport. I started competing in jujitsu. But the thing about jiu-jitsu is jiu-jitsu is eternal. It carries, it doesn't matter who you are. Every role is different. Whatever you do is different. Even if you win every single fight, you're still going to keep turning up. I suddenly realized that it is the infinite game. And I think that's where my, it was Singapore which taught me around being more venom in my business um, and being, and not just thinking that I'm just a strength conditioning coach in that, that I, I, at first I was, I was F7 performance and then I was just made myself all photos, strength and nutrition. And then um, the stage job collective was born. Then the, the sort of branding was born two years ago, but we've been running for about just under 18 months. Mm-hmm. Five years ago was, was when I, I've been in Singapore six months. 
I think. And I realized that, hang on a minute, I'm getting paid triple what I used to get paid as a rugby player. I've got more financial freedom. I'm happier. I'm physiologically in a better place. I looked better. I felt better. All this stuff. I've realized that my shortcomings as an athlete were, 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 were because I, did, I, I played professionally, but I didn't play. I played like whatever, professional A-leagues. Emotions, rugby player. Everybody wants to play for England. Everybody wants to be a superstar. Was I good enough for that? Probably not. But at the time, I wanted to be. I wanted to prove that I could. But the world was different, and the way that I, the way that I, I, I said that I wanted to be a professional rugby player. Technically, I did my job. I said that I would do that. I didn't say out there I wanted to play a hundred games for this. And I think verbalizing your exact destination is massive because I think that again, that law of attraction piece of you keep fighting to find that bit. But yeah. It, 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 it took me to move countries to figure that out because in the UK, it was never going to happen. Right. So the tipping point started. I think just what shines through is the amount that you're investing in yourself in learning. Right. And people sometimes don't realize like this is an infinite game as well. Like it doesn't stop even all the way through your life. You're going to still be soaking up knowledge and soaking up ways and going and speaking. And there's a few different things there, right? You're, you were bold enough to go and walk up to someone at the, at the conference to say, hey, that hit me. And I now need, because of that, I need to make this happen. I need to meet you or whoever else because you knew that that was a bridge to your destiny and you knew that that connected with your desire of where you're going. And it's just, it's super powerful because it's just, what you just explained is what other people might be sitting there listening to this right now and thinking, how can I do more? What, what else can I be doing? Oh, I've done all this extra stuff and just the volume, the sheer volume of learning and sharpening and dissecting and the fact that you realized you're multidimensional and that it isn't just a linear path straight up sportsman yeah. and that's it that you've got so much more to offer and that you're now going to fuel it and feed feed the, the the beast inside that is the real beast right mm -hmm. you're going to let that out and and shine effectively 100 percent like we, I, I, when someone signs up with us at the moment, I, I, we go through, I make them take um, Dr. John Demartini's value paradox, basically. If you do not understand your values, you'll not understand what actually makes you tick. Mm -hmm. And then once you understand what makes you tick, what we do is we put that towards your personality and then we put that towards what's literally happening in front of me, exercise, living, nutrition. And you'll see there's so many places where you're not actually living up to your highest values. That was one of the biggest game changes. I had a three, four years ago, I, I talked to a, um, he's big in the, in the fitness space called Mark Coles, massive on value systems. I did it with him. I then did Dr. John De Martini's breakthrough experience, and it blew my mind in relation to how much we, how much, how important that is for many different places. But I always knew that when I, the people that, there's, there's two things like now knowing there's a, there's a book called The Alter Ego Effect by uh, Dan Hoffman, David Hoffman. He talks about who do you want to become and acting like them and put in different fields in where you are, i.e. When I first got into personal training, uh, uh, there's a very prestigious PT and coach called Phil Learning. I always used to say to myself, what would he do? Mm -hmm. Like I, every time when I was a new, new coach in Singapore and I was taking his course around business and, and nutrition and stuff, I was like, what would he have done? Because he was the head PT of the biggest gym in Mayfair when I was growing up and when I was an aspiring coach. But I also realized that you had to pay to play. I think too many people are very much, like I said, we talked about buying that shit Porsche before, is you're, they're focused on materialistic outcomes rather than thinking, if I invest in this, what will it offer me? I still pay, I've paid over 50,000, nearly 50,000 pounds in, in education. I, I, I've got a current mentor like who is who systemizes my business called Matt Peacock. We are optimized for any strength coaches. Strongly recommend Dude's a legend. But point is, is that's not 50 quid a month. That's that's like I take my profit that I make from my business and I funnel it straight back into something that is going to grow me and grow my business because it is that pay to play. If, if I want to make 20,000 pounds a month, 200,000 pounds a month, 2 million pounds a year, whatever it is, I need to be paying someone or someone to show me, holding my hand and guiding me down that narrow path of, I've done all this shit on the outside. This is how you do it. And that's what I do in my business now is, is I unpack people's shit. I, I unpack why they're struggling, why they're feeling alienated, overwhelmed, 
unfulfilled and I give them the tools and tasks and systems to go, actually, you're not actually that far off. Your issue is that you're speaking to this audience that you don't actually care about. Instead of speaking to people that you that you care about, I'm a big like, I, I love being the black sheep. Like I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the weirdo. I like being weird. It's more fun, isn't it? Being normal is boring. Like, but the people, I attract people who feel the same. And yeah. I, and that's, that's similarly like, that's why me and you get along is because we both know that in, in normal circles, normal circles in Nottingham, normal circles now in Manchester or London, People think you're an alien. They look at you like really? what? Completely, yeah. You put a book and it's sold X, and you're doing what? And you you live in sing- people look at you like you're not a joke in a bag, but they're like you, you're not real. My my, I always have like why not? Like why not? Like if but you, people will underestimate the the investment you have to have in you. And if you're looking after other people before yourself, you're never, ever, ever going to operate at a high level, period. Because if it's the, it's the airplane analogy of you got to breathe first before giving to somebody else. It is exactly the same for everything. You can't be unhealthy to help your missus and your kids because then you're not a role model. And if you've got to go play football with your kid and you can't because you're too overweight, problem. If you're in a boardroom and you're telling somebody to do a job that you wouldn't do back when you were them, problem. I think... It, it, People are very unempathetic in that respect, or they don't get it that you earn the right to get to the next level of the ladder. And that comes with experience and putting in the fucking work and understanding why, when, and how you're doing it, because then you can either teach it, utilize it, or adapt it and overcome it. That's probably where I think my biggest learning, steep learning curve was it would have been year two. I was in Singapore five years. So my second year when I was business was good, but I always wanted more, more mm. money, more mm. time, online business. I wanted to train athletes. I, and I, I wasn't any better than anybody else, but I was relentless. I was like, nah, you're going off and pissing off to Bali. No, nope, going to Australia, paying four grand to go to a, a seminar, but with people who I know full well are making fucking 10 grand a month. Come on, cool. Get to 10 grand a month in Singapore. Now I want someone who makes 20 grand a month. How do I do it? It's it's that's that's it. That's that's what it was. And it's never convenient, right? That's the other thing to call out. Never. It's, it's never convenient. You're not going down there on this nice little holiday, or you're going to this course who's run. It's at weird times in the night. It's not when you want to be, you want to be going to Bali, but you have to make that decision. And that's something that I think as well gets missed in in all of this. So just props to you, my man, props to you for doing this and to show people how else to do it and how else to live, right? Because it's a way of life. And when you change their identity to connect, to back in to what they really want and they, you put it in front of them every single day and you show them how it's possible. That's why my motto is believe it, it's possible, right? Because you have to know it's possible. You have to get, and you've got that. And I see that. And it's just, I love every bit about what you're saying about how you break down your process here about how you're always raising the bar and you're surrounded you're surrounding yourself with the people that have been there and done that so that then you can learn from them and not you're not afraid of and and so back to the three c's confidence clarity and what was the first like certainty certainty so certainty of purpose certainty of purpose and the certainty of what you're doing so as especially it's mainly especially as a coach is Everything, as a coach, the problem with everything as a coach is it's all gray area. There's so many variables. And the problem with what coaches do, especially, and guys who are still, the guys who are leaders are the same, is they overanalyze the outcome and they overanalyze the first start of a process instead of adapting and moving as the process is happening. My job is to show people how they're getting from A to B, like, and, and the journey of, of doing that and being, and literally, Sit in my pocket and I'm gonna show you where we're going, man. Like I, that, that's literally it. Like, I, and I had this. I had a conversation yesterday with a, with a, with one of my work with the guys, the ladies that I mentor. We went over one of her clients for for 45 minutes. And everything she was doing was correct, everything. But there was two or three things in there that, if they were reframed, reworded, and redone in a different way, suddenly this is it's, we're flying. Same thing is. The certainty is, is I'm not I'm not sure how I'm going to win. I just know I'm not going to lose. That's the, and I know it's from a film and it's corny as it is, but that literally sums me up, is 
I don't know how I'm going to win this game because it's never ending. I just know that I'm not going to get outworked. I know I'm not going to get out hustled. And if somebody does want to start start a fight with me, not metaphorically, or they what they want to start pushing back on me, put the t-shirt off. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Like I, because I'm not afraid. I'm not scared of being beaten up. I'm not scared of being in a room with people who are absolute sharks who are going to embarrass me because I'm so little. Because I know full well that I've got the fortitude and the resilience to be good. I'm supposed to feel like shit here. I'm supposed to feel little because then you're going to start swimming harder, swimming harder, swimming harder. And lo and behold, you become the shark you said you wanted to. That's so what put, I want You're to putting do. yourself in a, a bigger room then. So you're saying, I want to upgrade the room to bring That's, that metaphor here. Yeah. You're saying, right, I'm, I'm not worried about getting into a room where people are better than me and me going to go fail. And I'm going to keep failing because I know that it's going to get me to where I want if, to go. If you're, not, if you're not failing, you're not learning. Too many people are frightened stiff of... Of failing. The reason why my social media is working for me now as a business rather than as, as just, just a formality, mm-hmm. I don't care what anyone else is doing. I, I, I literally, I follow and look at people who I want to aspire to be. I use systems and strategy in that that I know they're using, and that's it. Not, I'm not going on the latest TikTok and finding out what the latest dance move is to get clients. I'm not going against my values and and liquidating my product and dancing on camera like a dick because I'm not like that. And I don't believe that's what substance. I know what I stand for. I know how I'm going to do it. And I pay money to get into rooms of people that I know full well would eat me alive financially or from a vocational standpoint. But it's just, it's exactly the same as training. The only way you adapt is by overreaching. You've got to be on that point of standing over the edge of the cliff going, fucking, I'm scared here. Because if you're, if you have the fear, you'll fight harder. If you know that you, if you know that others are doing the same thing, but they're surviving, they're only human. They, it, it, there's, I'd love to think there's Superman around it, or I'd love to be Batman because Superman's a bit, a bit can't be doing that, can you? I'd love to think that, but everyone who you aspire to be or who's operating at a high level is is not anything more special than you are. The difference is is that they're running their process and their purpose to what they actually want to do and desire. And they're unstoppable. And that's that again, ming in word because people associate it, but it's very true. Is I want to keep progressing. Full stop. How that looks, I don't know. We'll see how that goes because it, it's all moving, isn't it? Creating that momentum. So I've seen you do some amazing things as well in the last couple of years. One of those was the run across Singapore, like just phenomenal with a weight belt on you, like a vest full of weights. Like what was going through your mind when you're doing that in the heat in Singapore all day and your child, was it 58k something around? 58K, yeah. 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 Bloody yeah. hell. Hats off to you again because that's not something you get out of bed and just decide to do. Like how, what was going through your mind when you're doing it and what, what parts and what lessons did you realize partly the way through that or at the end? Um. A, friend, a client of mine who was a, an elite level Ironman and a an ultra marathon runner before, I asked him this question before, and I was like, "Mate, how do you do that?" And he said, "It's nothing to do with your body; it's training your mind. You, if you keep, do the plan with your body, the difference between you completing it is between your ears." I'm I'm very um, how do you say? I'm very dopamine driven, so I'm very like I'm, I'm like a, an adrenaline junkie. Speed, power, fighting people, playing rugby, smash, bang, knockouts, all that stuff. I love it because it's so fast and explosive. That race was very much a case of, of, of knowing that this was going to take a long time. Now, training up to it, obviously, I did a lot of training for it and then all the nutrition and this kind of stuff. But then, obviously, there were two main elements to it. One, I ran with... Um, a lot of the people who joined in with us, we, we had a, we had a bit we had a mission for one of the guys' fathers passed away of uh, motor neuron disease, so we earned, we we raised a load of money for that. So there was a big like driving factor of we're not doing this for us. I think the minute you put you take your 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 yourself out of that equation mm-hmm. and you you're doing this for a higher cause, anything's possible because the minute you're feeling tired, the minute you're feeling sick. The minute you're about to, again, pardon my French, want to crap yourself because you've eaten so many gels and you feel actually feel terrible and it's the middle of the night and all these, all these excuses that your mind will play tricks on you with because it's not normal. Your body's not wanting to do that. 
when you have a higher purpose it, 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 like you said is is we complete the mission that is the mission that is we had to make it. and usually i'm the kind of dude who's either running with a podcast and learning or some seriously heavy drum and bass in because i need something to keep me jig up nine minutes uh, just under night like what we did eight and something hours um no earphones in running from the middle of like, the afternoon no earphones with you and it's funny we because we, i ran with two particular people in the end uh, dylan and lee we we ran together and um there was others who were joining us like sam palmer and stuff we were all in this together but we sort of staggered us three stayed together and we were just i remember just um basically i was just talking rubbish by the end of it because it was my natural instinct because when i was a rugby player and it was the last few minutes of the game and we're one point up or we had to score my my the way that I got into my opposition's head was I, if I was loud or if I was if I was telling if I was talking, it didn't look like I was tired. It didn't look like I was scared. It didn't look like that I was shitting myself, going, "Oh my god, we could lose this." It, 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 I put on a mask of we we can do it, even though sometimes I didn't believe we could, especially in rugby. But if I put this mask on, I was underneath someone's piece of armor, and they're going, "Oh my god, he's coming." And I think it was the same with the run was was the more that I communicate, the more that we were allowed, the more that we just like in each other's ear, like, mate, you've got more than this. And, and, and being that and talking to that alter ego effect of like, you've got more, more, there's more in the locker. Mm -hmm. There was a study done um, with the US Navy SEALs where they did a, like a white noise, like torturing test kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they basically had scores and people would say they were finished or they, they'd had enough 40% uh, before they actually did so they had another 40 percent before they actually had to quit because they were that bad so in my head was like if it's that bad i've got 40 more percent like and no like yeah. okay you're saying you ain't got it watch you, you, you just you put one foot in front of the other and the, like yeah it was amazing like don't get me wrong the, the, <laughs> one of the hardest things i've ever done like apart from the, this snowden race that i did last week uh, two weeks ago three weeks ago well, yeah like, that leads me to my next question like this this feeds into that, right? Because that race, that is the hardest thing you've ever done, as you, as you said. Um, yeah. And I guess that race is, again, even more hardcore, right? Because you're what, 24 hours, 12 p.m. till 12 p.m. You're mm -hmm. racing up Mount Snowden on your own, yeah. that in the race. Obviously, you were, yeah. you go, but like, talk us through that as well, because that is just unbelievable <laughs> unbelievable so the, the race was 25 trail run up and down ladan Berris trail of mount snowden so it's seven and a half k up seven and a half k down but it's not it's a mountain it's like this um it runs over 24 hours obviously so 12 lunchtime on the saturday just sort of sunday in the lunchtime um in an i go you go fashion so my 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 man brad uh, he's the one I took to the Ironman in Utah and competed in the championship. He's built for this. He bought me this as a Christmas present, as a joke, because he was like, mate, <laughs> you always make me do this horrible training. I'm going to make you do it. Um, and it's basically, he runs up it back down, tags me and we go. Uh, with the ambition, it never been ran before. It was the first event they've ever done. And basically, if you hit 10 ascents of the mountain as a team, they called it the Everest Award, which is about, it's the same elevation as getting to base camp, basically. So, um, unfortunately, I, I lost my father in March to cancer. Um, very sudden, threw me off, in a, which was, again, lucky I came home. That, 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 that piece of suddenly I had, because we, we were going to do it anyway as a joke, I suddenly had a huge driving force and a purpose that to try and funnel that emotion into because the hardest thing I've ever seen like the most horrible thing I've ever seen and unfair and all these other words, all that stuff. It, it, it's just, it just very much a case of like, it just wasn't fair. But on the flip of it, there was nothing I could do about it. And there are other people who are, who are dealing with this. And I, it was a bit my way of, of, of giving back and actually feeling like I'd done something because I had no control. It's the first time in my life I had no control. If there's a problem, I'll solve it. If there's a solution, I'll pay for it. If there's someone who can do it, I'll pay them a lot of money to do it. And my dad was diagnosed. He was dead in four weeks. Like he went from, he went from being the dude cycle 12 care day, not eating, eating clean, happy, whatever. Just like someone pulled a plug out of him and it was vile. So 
we we said we we said we were like right we're going to go to this race do it for Macmillan but there has to be a caveat to it it can't just be we're going to walk up and down it we'll do it 10 times we'll get the top award let's go so we um we turned up there was 400 400 people doing it I think 300 and something and we, two three weeks before me and Brad went and ran it as like a pre-op race and I've never done something and run up something or, or done something physical where I've looked myself in the mirror and gone, mate, what the fuck are you doing? This is like, I've done a lot of dumb stuff. I've done a lot of like physical feats of fighting. I, I've, I've, I've done jujitsu, as I said. I've been in some big rugby games. I've tackled some big dudes who are way bigger than me. This is a different, Mother Nature is, is, is the most beautiful and scary thing ever. Like this was vile. Anyway, it didn't phase me because, again, the same mentality of, I'm just going to give it a go. If I fall flat on my ass and we do six, I'll either walk up another two times each or I'll put my hands in the air and go, do you know what? That was literally the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I've given it a go. Mm -hmm. Long story, again, we started the race. Um, Brad went first because he's he's, just, he's giddy. And also knowing that he would, he would set the pace for me because mm. if I ran... Yes, I'll run it as far as I can, but is that good enough? Because Brad, anything comes to me and wants to deadlift against me, I'll snap him in half. I want to run against him. He's got me flying. So my thought was, if someone's pushing me, I will make sure that I'll move. He, we, he, he started probably 250th and he came back fourth. Like he ran it in one hour 54. And I'm literally at the end of the start line thinking, what are you doing? I, me, bang the first one, two hours 15, which I was really happy with. And it was very much a case of, I was in a, a massive hurt locker. Like my, my, mm. <laughs> everything, physically, my body was going, what are you doing? Emotionally, obviously, because of the day it is, it was very, very I, it was funny. When you're on the mountain, you, you very much are fighting between your ears again. Like you're, you're, I knew why I was doing it. And every time I thought about it, it, it would make me well up and get me emotional. On the flip of it, I'll stop myself getting upset because that was going to be no good to anybody. Me being a blubbering mess and being passionate and emotional then was fucking useless. Like clinical. We're here to we're here to take names, we're here to win, we're here to push ourselves. Don't let you, 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 my, my dad would want, wouldn't want me to do that so I was like no you're, you're here to you're here not just for you to, to operate at a higher level you can you can express how grateful you are and how sad you are later um yeah so <laughs> on that, jumping on like how because like, that's like thank you so much for sharing this because like my deepest sympathies for what happened oh, thank you but this and I, but this part like it will help so many people around like you're running up the mountain and if you don't mind just like how did you you had to keep your mind disciplined on the fact that your dad would want you to execute and to do this challenge in the best way you can rather than flipping it the other way and obviously being yeah. uh, sad and letting the emotion rule which is so difficult when you're putting yourself under pressure of what you're doing yeah. which is something which is an environment you've not or a place mentally and physically that you've not been before because you've not done this feat before how did you how, was there times that that flipped back and then you had to like ready yourself and just go back to this is what my dad would have wanted or was it quite you just were so solid in knowing that piece that you you knew what you were doing for you knew that you were giving it your best shot and all the things you just explained yeah i there was one point where I was on the, the fourth descent. So we'd done eight, this would be the eighth. And this would have been, what would have been, that would have been 20 hours. No, 18 hours in. And Even I was running down the mountain. Mental, right? Even just saying that is absolutely, I'm 20 <laughs> hours in to running up and down a mountain. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, <laughs> um, and I ran past uh, I'm, I'm 20 minutes from the top coming down. So I'm, I'm all way down. And a guy ran past me. And in my head, I was there going, cool, right. So we've got, um, we've got four hours and 30 minutes to get two more in. Realistically, not going to happen because the race stops at 24 hours. So we were going to hit nine, which we were still, at this point, we knew we were in the lead. 
my head was at first the, the sort of the, the 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 emotional state behind me was like cool let me get down from eight me and brad can rest me and him will both get up together after the race to technically make it 10 from mcmillan um and this boy runs and runs running up the mountain it was like a weasel and he's like oh yeah how are you like, i'm good man how are you whilst I, again different story I, I couldn't stop being sick because of of my body was just shutting down basically. So every 15 minutes, I spew my guts up. This dude was like, "Oh yeah, I'm in the I'm in the pairs as well, and we're just on our eighth. And as soon as I heard this, I was like, "Uh, uh-uh, I'm not getting doing 24 hours of running and winning an ultra marathon race at the size that I am and losing to a weasel because I because I decided to to, to take the easy option and and not allow us to get ninth. So at first, I was listening to uh, Johnny Wilkerson's podcast very very deep very like it's all super deep it's amazing flipped it onto drum and bass at the top and i've never ran so quick feeling so bad in my life now at that point my emotional side of my brain as soon as he said that he was catching me i went into that red rage state i went into that like fuck this that let's go i'm i'm no way and i could feel it coming like I, I was i was tearing up and i was feeling i i had endless energy which is actually a, that's a central nervous system response your body liberates cortisol and, and blood sugar so this is all it's all interlinked and i i know what's going on so i'm there going like well, i'm good but i'm starting to get upset because i'm there going like my foot my primitive side to my brain is saying you you're straight away you don't lose this for your dad which is absolute bullshit but that's not a cognitive side of your head. That's not the bit that's actually thinking. That's the primitive bit, yeah? So I, I rang Brad, and he's actually gone to bed. I was like, oi, I'm down in 45 minutes. You need to get the knife to win this, but I won't let you run this on your own. So I will go back to back, and we'll get 10 together. Get your shit on, and we're going. And he apparently he's in the van kicking off. Like He's like, oh, they're <laughs> kicking off. So yes. I, and long story short, we I literally ran in, refueled straight back up the mountains. So I did 30k back to back, um, and we ended up coming in 19 minutes before the deadline. So we won, we won the whole race as a pair. We got nine nine ascents on their books, but technically 10 in 24 hours. But that was the only time where I, if you'd given me that five years ago, I'd have been, I'd have hurt myself. I'd have fallen over. I would have not thought. I would have, because that's the thing about going down a mountain, and it's like this: is that you're actually you have to think about what you're doing you can't just like if you do a marathon you i could do a marathon crawling because mm. it's just on a road this mm. is dangerous if you're not so i that's how i knew that i grew up is that i was able to funnel that emotional energy and calm it down yeah and then after the race don't get me wrong like after after the race i didn't really know what to do myself i felt really sort of like elated that we just done something crazy but also, obviously, then it started, emotions started happening. I started getting sad, but then it wasn't sad because like, my dad's mantra was be daring, be different, be decisive. That was his like thing he taught me. And everything about, about that race was those three things. We talked about yeah, that. Yeah. That, was the, that was the motto, and that's been your motto. Like, right. That's your motto, and that, that's, it links in. And man, that, like, just everything you just said there is just so beautiful, but like also so powerful because it's, it's the culmination of even of just what we've all been, what you've been sharing today, because it's you in one of the most difficult, most high level situations of your life, being able to calm yourself down and execute that flow so that you were flying, but also yeah. recognizing the danger that if you just let go, you could, where you would actually fall down, use, used to fall down, you were actually doing it yeah, yeah. to the best of your ability. And it was actually, a huge huge win massive so, so at the end then there was it all sort of came out in different forms or ways of expression yes like and it's it's death's a really weird thing like like i said the hardest thing i've ever seen the hardest thing i've ever been through and I, I, i've been through absolute hurt because emotionally from losing everything and moving up north with literally just my dog and starting again to physically being told I'll be half a paraplegic basically we have my legs snapped in half and then now I'm okay touch wood I've been through some tough stuff but because I know I could back myself and I could try in those situations and I could outlast those situations I knew that I'd be okay with my dad like he, he he quit smoking 30 years ago um 
and he basically got lung cancer, um, which, which started off as pneumonia, went in, and he had can like we thought this was a little thing. He had cancer from the stem of his head to his feet. Like you looked at him, you looked like he was shot with a paintball gun, like it was everywhere. Given six months, three to six months to live, passed away in four weeks. Um, and he loads of detail of, of his lung collapsing and, and him losing oxygen. Loads of the horrible stuff that people I, I don't wish on anybody, I wouldn't wish it on my enemy. But like I said, I didn't have control of that. Hmm. The, the the only saving grace of, of of any of this is giving is knowing that you have not got time to muck around. Like I, there's obviously if you, anyone's in the stoic philosophy, momentum mori right, means it, you could die. And this was the first time. It's the only way that I've dealt with this is that I haven't got time to worry about pointless shit that is that is going to suppress me because I could I could be I could be gone. My 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 closest friend, um, he was doing a job that he hated, and I literally said to him, I said, "If you've got my dad was sixty three, so he, he was sixty three going sixty four. Um, if you have thirty years to live and you're spending half them doing a job that you hated, as soon as that he's gone off and he's doing getting a new job, and but it, it's horrible that that he had to take something so disgusting, like vile, to happen." And I, I, the only way that I can I can ever be balanced with it is knowing that I want to take my dad's energy. And I've realized that I'm him, which you don't realize as a son. Like until you have father and son talks that I'd never, again, I never wish, I wish I didn't have to have those, but I did. Mm -hmm. I've realized that everything he's taught me and given me is what's made me what I am right now. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm determined to get, because the amount of people that I reached out and said that my dad changed their life. Like my dad was a, an executive, uh, he was a creative director for Jaguar Land Rover at this point. Very artistic, very creative. My dad was a dick. Like he, everyone loved me because he was very real, very open. But he just wanted that. He wanted to make you smile and have a laugh. And I am, but he had that edge of I'm here to. I'm not here to take part. I'm here to take over. But I have a laugh whilst doing it. And I think that's exactly what I'm. I want from people is you have not got time to do things that you should not be doing or don't want to be doing. Do something about it and help yourself get out of that hole and live every minute as, as hard as you can because you are not you do not deserve to be here because if if you did my dad would still be here and it, and unfortunately it's left a massive hole in my family but on the flip of it I know that the only way to do to, to move forward is to move forward and to to do not his not his life's work but to be to be present and know. This is what I. This is what I'm. This is why I'm operating the way that I am, not to someone else's hymn sheet. I'm doing my way because I have. Tomorrow, if something happens. I've, it is what it is. That's literally what it is. Is horrible, but it's the only way I can. Obviously, you talk things about growth mindset, and close mindset. It's not why me. It's try me. I have to, the only way I can do this. It, it, if I sit here and wallow in my own shit, then yeah, then that's going to be a problem. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm a big, there'll be a time where, where I, obviously during that I was operating a business and I've just, I literally just bought a house and within seven days I moved back home. There's a lot has happened in this last however long. And this race sort of masked that emotion of, I was very much funneling my anger into that. There will be a time and there is a time where I'm going to, I'm, I'm obviously going to be grieving and it's going to hit me in the face and it is going to be really, really hard. But I've given myself permission to, for that to happen. And if anybody, and I'll tell it, I'm, I'm very open. I'll tell anybody, like, grief is grief is a funny thing. Some people can grieve not and, 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 and figure out the balance of it. Some people, it strangles them. My thing is, I let it, I let it go in the time when, when it, things align to let it go. And it, that'll be fine. Thank you, my brother. Oh, good, man. That's so powerful and just, it's going to help so many people especially people that completely resonate with what you're saying um mate, really powerful no thank you man all good but yeah man i can see that it's burning white hot for you now and you've got that you know that desire that's just amped up right it's taking it to the next level i can see that flying through you i can see it in your business in the way that you're talking in all of the social media as i said but it's just it's the culmination of all of this and it's the journey that you've been on 
And people can see it right from you. You're a direct example of what you're teaching. You will not stop. You will keep expanding. We were born to expand and to get more. Exactly. We want and to have these desires out there that we're not going to stop until we get because they're a direct reflection of what we were put on this earth to do. And I love that you've been able to connect with all of that over the last five years and change this. And now you're changing other people's lives. So, Wolf Oden, thank you, my man, for coming on and just delivering the most awesome words that I've ever heard on this podcast and just being an absolute legend and showing up today in all, all of this glory and all of the brightness that's coming out of you. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Thank you. No, thank you very, very much for having me, man. Like I said, it's resonate with like-minded people through you and through your podcast is is a small percentage of what's out there, but this is the thing that's going to help people and grow people. And I'm very, very privileged to be able to share my story and, and to be part of your, and you have, have you part of my journey, especially. And like you said, iron sharpens iron. And that's not just us two, that's everybody that's listening. So definitely, if I, if I can help anybody, I'm very, very happy to. And I'm very glad that I've had the opportunity to speak to a wider audience. Thank you very much. How can they get in touch? Or what's the best way for them to talk to you? Best way uh, is just follow me on Instagram, at Will Foden, or at Station Collective. At Will Foden is my personal one. I've, I'm at the moment, I'm basically running stuff through there. Um, on website, at willfoden.com, that will be changing the, the Station Collective one's being built at the moment. Uh, or email me, uh, info at willfoden.com. Um, but DM on Instagram, which is the quickest, or LinkedIn. Both of those, I'll be on it. You want to say hello, want to catch up, need, need some guidance or some description, or just to say, just a fist pump to say that you've been there, you've been there too. Definitely love to connect with people.